Hello and welcome back to The Simple Truth. Um, today we will be entering Romans chapter 14. Uh, we just finished 12, dealing with uh, some church conduct like spiritual gifts and some kind of individual uh, church conduct. In chapter 13 we dealt with the government, how we are to submit to governmental authorities and what happens when we do and the consequences of when we don't, um, such as resisting arrest and which could result in dire consequences there. And today we're entering into chapter 14, which again talks about uh, Christian, um, how we deal with each other within the church, uh, our service to each other, our, how, how we interact, our relationships with each other. And primarily what we can expect to find today is Paul, this chapter, it's mainly towards those who are stronger in faith, kind of more mature, if you will, um, and he, he's kind of cautioning them about how, how to get along with and how to help out uh, younger Christians and those who may not be as mature or free in the faith um, as other Christians. So yes, there are Christians on different levels, and the Holy Spirit is working in each one of us just a little bit differently. No two of us are exactly alike, so the way he works within us will be that much different with uh, with who he's dealing with. So having said that, by way of introduction, as you turn with me to Romans 14, I will go ahead and ask the Lord's blessing. Lord, we just thank you for this day. We ask, Lord, that you would open our eyes and ears to hear and see what you would have for us for today, Lord, and this day and age. We thank you for it, Lord, in your name, Jesus. Amen. So let's go ahead and take the first four verses of Romans 14, and Paul writes, Receive one who is weak in the faith, but not to disputes over doubtful things. For one believes he may eat all things, but he who is weak eats only vegetables. Let not him who eats despise him who does not eat, and let not him who does not eat judge him who eats. For God has received him. Who are you to judge another's servant? To his own master he stands or falls. Indeed, he will be made to stand, for God is able to make him stand. So again, this section deals with uh, Christians of different levels of faith and in different levels of maturity, uh, different depths in Christ. It reveals that the Holy Spirit is working in each of us individually with the ultimate goal of bringing us all into the image of Christ. That our different levels of faith and different levels of the Holy Spirit's work should not result in division and arguments among us or strife. Paul points out that a person who puts themselves under legal limitations um, in an effort to be pleasing to God is actually weak in faith. Uh, the, more, the more religious limitations one has, the weaker in faith they seem to be. Um, so being a vegetarian for health reasons is fine. That might be better for you. But to not eat meat thinking that it is sinful um, is not fine. Um, that's the distinction here. You can do whatever you want. You can wash your hands before you eat. You can eat with dirty hands. It does not matter. Um, as far as God and sin is concerned, you may, again, you may do these things for health reasons as it probably is a good idea to wash your hands before you eat. Wash your lettuce before you eat. Um, but... To do it for, for a religious reason, to be pleasing to God, is what Paul is, is saying here, is not, it's not the right thing to do. God is not pleased with our washing of hands. Um, and he, he touched on this in Matthew chapter 15, verses 10 through 20. If you want to turn there, yeah, I'm going to read 10 verses. Matthew 15, 10 through 20 says this, and he called the multitude to him and said to them, Hear and understand, not what goes into the mouth defiles a man, but what comes out of the mouth, this defiles a man. Then his disciples came and said to him, Do you know that the Pharisees were offended when they heard this saying? But he answered and said, Every plant which my, fa my heavenly Father has not planted will be uprooted. Let them alone. They are blind leaders of the blind. And if the blind leads the blind, both will fall into a ditch. 
Then Peter answered and said to him, Explain this parable to us. Jesus, so Jesus said, Are you still without understanding? Do you not yet understand that whatever enters the mouth goes into the stomach and is eliminated? But those things which proceed out of the mouth come from the heart, and they defile a man. For out of the heart proceed evil thoughts, murders, adulteries, fornications, thefts, false witness, blasphemies. These are the things which defile a man. But to eat with unwashed hands does not defile a man. So clearly the, the ceremonial law from the past, uh, the Old Testament ceremonial laws that they were observing in an effort to be righteous and holy, Jesus was saying, no, because of the cross, all that stops. Uh, you no longer have to try and be ceremonially pleasing to God. Um, so did Jesus die to only free us from the ceremonial law? What about the moral law? Don't steal, don't kill, don't, do, don't lie, uh, don't do all this and that. What about the moral law? Did Jesus die to free us from all that too? Yes, and we'll get into that more when we get into Galatians. That seems kind of strange. What do you mean? Does that mean I can murder now? No, because Jesus took it to a whole other level at the cross. It's, it's not just thou shalt not kill. It's uh, Jesus' desire was by his Holy Spirit to bring about a change within us to the degree that we would not even think about such things. And he explained that to even think about murder, to have hatred in your, in your heart for your brother to that degree, puts you before the Father as if you were guilty, as if you had done it, just that guilty. So Jesus' uh, thought was, you know, that you've heard it said, thou shalt not kill, but I'm not going to let you run around with all kinds of crazy evil thoughts in your head. You're just as wrong before my Father. You look good on the outside because you say, well, gee, I've never killed anyone. But your heart is an open thoroughfare for Satan's thoughts. And so the Lord says, no, I'm coming to give you a power to be transformed by the renewing of your mind. That's the, what he's doing with us. And that's the level, the depth of salvation is it is transforming. Well, it's not just about doing good deeds and trying to be pleasing before God because I washed my hands before I ate. That to me, when you look at the depth of Christianity and then look at that, that seems so trivial. And that's what Jesus says. Hey, if it goes into your mouth, it's not a problem. That's not the issue. He says it's what's coming out of your mouth. That's the issue. That's what he wants to clean up. Um, so those who may be stronger in faith, should be sensitive to those who may be weaker in faith, um, not judging. But for these reasons, Paul was careful in selecting leadership over the church. He didn't. He, he was careful in who he chose to be leadership in the church for these very reasons, um, and that's why he says in First Timothy three verses 2 and verse 6. I want to read verse 2 and then verse 6. A bishop then must be blameless, the husband of one wife, temperate, sober-minded, of good behavior, hospitable, able to teach. Verse 6. Not a novice, lest being puffed up with pride, he fall into the same condemnation as the devil. So there you go. Even in, even in the selection of leadership, Paul is looking for Christians who have a depth, who have a maturity, who understand uh, that, you know, these things that uh, don't touch this, don't handle that, um, these, these little things that kind of trip up people, uh, the pastor, the, the leadership of the church was to be more understanding and realize the Christian liberty and Christian freedom we have. They're to be of a more mature nature uh, to understand this uh, in, in selecting leadership. So let's go back to... Romans 14, and read verses 5 through 9. One person esteems one day above another, another esteems every day alike. Let each be fully convinced in his own mind. 
He who observes the day observes it to the Lord. And he who does not observe the day to the Lord, he does not observe it. He who eats, eats to the Lord, for he gives God thanks. And he who does not eat, to the Lord he does not eat, and gives God thanks. For none of us lives to himself, and no one dies to himself. For if we live, we live to the Lord, and if we die, we die to the Lord. Therefore, whether we live or die, we are the Lord's. Uh, verse 9. For to this end Christ died and rose and lived again, that he might be Lord both of the dead and of the living. So there are two main thoughts in this. What's he talking about as far as the day goes? Is he talking about holidays or what? Um, well, I want to present both uh, because both, I think, carry good weight. And we can learn from both. So some think that uh, this may refer to the day of worship. As in, uh, is it Saturday, the Sabbath, or is it Sunday, Resurrection Day? Uh, Jesus taught uh, the day of worship doesn't matter. And I want to go back and, and uh, help out because the way he presents these things, all of our little trivialities seem so trivial. All of our little pettiness. When you hear Jesus speak and, and he says, you're the one. <laughs> you're the one matter. Stop your bickering and arguing and pettiness because this is what God is really after. And that's found in John chapter 4 verses 20 through 23. Starting at verse 20 in John 4. Uh, the lady at the well says, Our fathers worshipped on this mountain, and you Jews say that in Jerusalem is the place where one ought to worship. So what's the issue, Lord? Do we worship here? Do we worship there? Jesus doesn't get caught in her little trap. He stays with the point. Verse 21, Jesus said to her, Woman, believe me, the hour is coming when you will neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem worship the Father. He could have just as easily said, neither on the Sabbath, neither on Sunday, neither uh, this in this place or that place. Your wedding doesn't need to be confirmed in the tabernacle in um, Salt Lake City. Your wedding doesn't need to be confirmed in the Vatican. You are married. It doesn't matter what church you get married in. Jesus is saying, all this is baloney. Drop this pettiness. Verse 22, you worship what you do not know. We we know what we worship for salvation is of the Jews, but the hour is coming and now is when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father is seeking such to worship Him. In other words, again, it doesn't matter where, what elevation you are, which room in your house you're in. The point is the Father is looking for those who will worship Him in spirit and in truth. It's not a physical thing, it's a spiritual thing. And that's what Paul's getting at here. Uh, that the, These little things should not be hang-ups. And definitely they should not be grounds for division and arguments within the church. There should be complete understanding and love for people who are coming along in Christ. So the, that's one thought um, that in this, in this portion in Romans, uh, some were thinking um, maybe he's referring to days as in days of the week or the month or whatever. Uh, the other school of thought is, um, since this portion, these verses, are in what I call an eating sandwich, um, it's, the context is Paul's talking about eating beforehand, eating afterwards. So the context these verses are mentioned in is the context of eating. So the other school of thought is, well, we cannot eat meat on certain days, whereas other people regard every day the same. I can have a bologna sandwich whenever I want. It doesn't matter. Um, some, some might eat only fish on Fridays. Um, that's fine for them if they want to, but don't think you're any closer with God or impressing Him because you do. That doesn't matter to God. What matters is, are you giving thanks for that fish regardless of what day you're eating it on? Doesn't, the day of the week doesn't matter. A.M. or P.M. doesn't matter. What's important is the giving of thanks, and we'll get into that later. Um, 
So both can be equally true since the greater context, the, again, the greater context of all this um, is legalism, the legalism of the weak in faith compared to the freedom of the strong or the mature in faith. The point and passion of Paul's is in verse 8. Uh, as he mentions the Lord three times, we can look at that again. For if we live, we live to the Lord. And if we die, we die to the Lord. Therefore, whether we live or die, we are the Lord's. He's saying above all this, it's all in, in, about Christ. It's not about this or that. Um, it's all about Christ. Our lives, as Paul, as Paul's was, our lives as Paul's was, is to be wrapped up in Christ's life, not in the petty things of this world. Uh, these actually are a form of bondage. Can I eat meat? Can I worship on Sunday? Can I worship on Saturday? Can I get married in any church? Can I, can I, can I? Stop. <laughs> yes, you can. So, and then, why did he write verse 9? For to this end Christ died and rose and lived again, that he might be the Lord both of the dead and of the living. This shows the extreme of the freedom Paul is trying to communicate here. So this is why Christ died, to free you from this bondage. He didn't just die, he rose again. That way he could be the Lord of all those. If you die in Christ, he's still your Lord. If you live in Christ, he's still your Lord, the same. So Paul's point is that we live Christ. We, we, we live Christ's... Um, Paul's point is that if we live, Christ is our life. And if we die, Christ is the determining factor in that. Where we die, when we die, how we die. It's not up to us. Our life is so wrapped up in Christ. He has our departure firmly in his control. And, and we can rest and relax in that. It's not going to come all of a sudden and take God by surprise. Um, he'll know exactly. Um, he's not going to be sitting up there, oh, wow, I didn't expect to see you so soon. Um, he has it all. He knows it all. And when you live, when you die, it's all in his hand. It's not going to surprise him. It might surprise you. In all things, Christ is the center and in full control of everything. So relax. Um, he, the point he's trying to make is if, well, what's going to that a little later on? Maybe in verse 14. Let's read 10 through 13 right now. Um, but why do you judge your brother? Or why do you show contempt for your brother? For we shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. For it is written, as I live, says the Lord, every knee shall bow to me, and every tongue shall confess to God. So then, each of us shall give account of himself to God. Therefore, let us not judge one another any more, but rather resolve this, not to put a stumbling block or a cause to fall in your brother's way. So because we all stand before Christ, we all will stand before Christ, um, it would be better for us to worry about the logs in our own eyes instead of the specks in our brother's eyes and to ask the Lord to search us and to help us not have a critical spirit about others. Uh, but instead, how can I be more one body? How can I be more united together in worship and in prayer with the brothers and sisters that I fellowship with? Not being petty and looking for what separates us but being spiritual and, and remember what unites us, and that's the blood of Christ. Um, now we get into verse 14 and 18, and this gets a little, a little more deep. Verse 14 through 18, I know and am convinced by the Lord Jesus that there is nothing unclean of itself, but to him who considers anything to be unclean, to him it is unclean. Yet if your brother is grieved because of your food, you are no longer walking in love. Do not destroy with your food the one for whom Christ died. Therefore, do not let your good be spoken of as evil. 
But the kingdom of God is not eating and drinking, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. For he who serves Christ in these things is acceptable to God and approved by men. You see the twist he says he puts on this? It's not a matter of the physical. It's the spiritual. Um, but, but he goes on to explain a little more in depth um, about the person who is weak. They need to be careful because in their weakness, if they violate their conscience, even though something might be okay for me, if it violates their conscience, they should not do it. The point is you need to be sensitive and listen to your conscience. That's where the Holy Spirit resides, whereas the enemy tries to come in more through your mind and your thoughts and the flesh. Uh, listen to the Spirit. Listen to your conscience. Uh, be sensitive to that. So, what happens if a Mormon converts and comes out of Mormonism and joins your church? Um, and they believe in their faith uh, not to consume caffeine and other products um, because it may be harmful to you, to your body. And your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit and you should not consume such things. Roy is the body. Um, they, so they leave Mormonism and join your church. And one Sunday you all go out to lunch and since they don't consume caffeine and wonder why, since our body is the temple of the Holy Spirit, why would we put a harmful chemical like that in it? And so when sitting around, would you be okay being sensitive to that brother or sister's need and maybe ordering a Sprite instead of a Coke? Um, or maybe just a water with lemon in it instead of a glass of tea so that it wouldn't be offensive to the new convert until they understand that the Lord's not concerned with go what goes into the mouth as he is with what comes out of the mouth. And that that cup of coffee is okay. That glass of tea is okay. It's not a sin. We will not be standing before Christ on Judgment Day. He said, you consumed 438 cups of coffee. Do you know what the punishment for that is? That's not the issue. It's what comes out of the mouth. That's what we're going to be called on the carpet for. So, out of love, would you abstain for them? Um, if a Muslim, who, according to their faith and their culture, they might think it's okay to smoke. And if they get saved, would you be offended at their smoke? You see how we kind of, there's little issues here and nuances. Would we think, oh, how dare they? They're not really a Christian because they smoke. They're growing up. Give them a chance. Let the Lord do His work. It's your job to catch the fish, not to clean the fish. That's the Holy Spirit's job. It's our job to be patient, walk in love and understanding. So, it's the Holy Spirit's problem, not yours. Unless you got a problem. Um, our part is to walk in love and not to offend and not to be offended. If somebody says something offensive, you have the choice to be offended or not. As a Christian, we need to make the choice to walk in love. Um, if they do something offensive, don't be offended. Make that choice. Um, but walk by the Spirit. And, and he, he, he even plugs these things in there. Um, that our walk is not to be marked by criticalness and judgmentalness and, and uh, legalism and such things, but our walk is to be defined with things like righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. And if you're walking around with a critical spirit, you're going to be grumpy like a bump on a pickle instead of um, full of the righteousness, peace, and joy that the Holy Spirit has planned for us. Those are spiritual things that you have to come out of your flesh in order to enjoy. Um, if you're caught up in, in what everybody else is doing, how can you have peace and joy? Verse 19. So, I guess to sum up in those things, I'm sorry. Um, I just want to make sure that as people get saved and you have different people coming in and out of the church, 
um, that, that we do not get caught up and hung up on different people coming in. They might not have the right haircut for us. Uh, they might not be dressed perfectly for us. Um, so what? Who made us the, the police clothes, or the clothes police? Um, who, who made us the haircut police? Um, <laughs> that's the Holy Spirit's job. If he wants to address such things at all, I'm sure the Holy Spirit would be more concerned about righteousness, peace, and joy. So uh, now let's go to verse 19. And actually, let's read it to the end. Verse 19 through the end. Therefore, let us pursue the things which make for peace, and the things by which one may edify another. Do not destroy the work of God for the sake of food. All things indeed are pure, but it is evil for the man who eats with offense. It is good neither to eat meat nor drink wine, nor do anything by which a brother stumbles or is offended or is made weak. Do you have faith? Have it to yourself before God. Happy is he who does not condemn himself in what he approves. But he who doubts is condemned if he eats because he does not eat from faith. For whatever is not from faith is sin. And that's what I was referring to before. If you can't give uh, thanks for before God, you should not be doing it. If you cannot enjoy a nice steak and, and say thank you Lord for this wonderful food that you provided, then you shouldn't be eating it. If you can't do it out of thanksgiving to God, that television show, if you can't eat it, consume it by faith, maybe you shouldn't be watching it. Um, if you can't sit there on the couch with the Lord and enjoy it, knowing that he's not going to be offended by it, perhaps you shouldn't be watching it. So whatever is not from faith is sin. Uh, let me get back to my notes before I digress into dangerous territories. Again, basic Christian conduct. We demonstrate the characteristics and nature of Jesus, who Matthew said in Matthew, a bruised reed shall he not break, and a smoking flax shall he not quench. So if, if Jesus is okay with the baby Christians coming into the church, having some issues and some hang-ups while he does his work in their life, that's okay. It's a process, man. One day at a time. The Lord is making us all closer and closer to him. But we're not all there at once. In fact, none of us have arrived yet. And I don't think on this side of glory, any of us ever will arrive. So since we're all in the same boat together, let's not be critical of one another. Instead, let's help one another. Amen? Amen. So, in verse 20, what we just read, do not destroy the work of God for the sake of food. <laughs> the thought here is that God may be working in the weaker Christians, and you may, may be more mature. Don't do what may be offensive to another Christian. Okay? If my having a cup of coffee would offend a new convert because they don't believe in consuming caffeinated products, I will not have a cup of coffee in front of them. Okay, out of love for that brother, because until they come to the point where they where they they understand the freedom we do have in Christ, I will not do that in front of them. I don't want to be an offense to them and a cause for stumbling. And I think in verse twenty one, that's what he's getting at. Or um, yeah, no second half of verse 20, but it is evil for the man who eats with offense. If I do something, that, that what that means is uh, it's evil for me to do something that is offensive knowledgeably. If I know that person is offended at that and I do it anyway, that's a problem. Even though for me, the action might not be a sin, I just made it one because I'm doing it deliberately knowing that it offends a brother in Christ. That's what Paul's saying here. Don't do that kind of stuff. Don't be like that Christian. Be sensitive to other Christians around you. Um, and walk that way in righteousness and in peace and enjoy the Holy Spirit. If it means giving up something in front of somebody else, out of love for that person, we do that. Um, 
Now, in the privacy of your own home, I know two different Chucks. Chuck Smith um, has. I was listening to him today, and he his testimony was, "I've never touched a drop of alcohol, and and he would never would." Okay, that was his belief. Whereas Chuck Missler, on the other hand, enjoyed an occasional glass of wine with a meal with his wife. Um, so, in the privacy of their own homes they can make those determinations. One thing Chuck Missler would need to be careful of is walking in the store to get that wine. What's other people going to be thinking? Alcoholic or does he have an issue privately, you know, that he's really not coming out and getting help with? Um, it could stir up thoughts in people. My grandfather never used to walk into a movie theater, uh, even though it was, there might have been a nice G-rated Disney movie or something he might have enjoyed. He didn't want to give the presentation uh, that there might be a possibility he was going to see the rated R movie. As the Bible says, shun even the appearance of evil. And he was sensitive to the people around him and didn't want to send the wrong message. So he abstained out of love for the sake of his congregation. Um, a man, what a man of God. And what I seek to strive to be like just a little bit. Even though you believe it is okay for you, it might be offensive. So around other Christians, we might not partake in some stuff. Um, and if a Christian is doing something that may be offensive to you, take it to the Lord. But don't yell at the person. Remember, it's not our job to clean the fish. Jesus said, I will make you fishers of men, not cleaners. That's the Holy Spirit's job. Let him do his job. So, if you, and the last part there, what he, what he sums it up with is, uh, eat from faith, for whatever is not of faith is sin. So if you can't thank God for anything that you're consuming, with your mouth, with your eyes, with your ears, if it's something that may be offensive to the Holy Spirit, to the Lord, it may be time to give up some stuff and be a little more cleaner. I know that in, in my own walk with the Lord, in, in going deeper, and this is what I read and read and read and read and read for years, even decades, um, and I was just resistant to it in going deeper with the Lord, but in, in, in going deeper with the Lord, there is a price, and there may be something that might not be sinful, but the Lord just says, uh, I want that. Are you willing to give that up? And spend a little more time with me to achieve that goal that you want of that closeness that you're jealous of that other Christians may have. Now you want that level of, of relationship with me, but it costs that. Are you willing to pay fill in the blank? And as you seek the Lord, he'll put his finger on different things in your lives. And you have to ask yourself, what is more important to you? That? Or just a little closer with the Lord. And I, I pray you make the right choice and choose the Lord over anything else this world has to offer. Nothing is in comparison to being a little more closer with Christ. Nothing, especially when you look back on it. And you'd be glad, wow, I'm sure glad I gave that up. Because now I can see how worthless and what Solomon was really talking about. The vanity and waste of it all. And I was doing that for so much of my life when I really should have been spending more time with the Lord and letting Him shape and mold me to be more Christ-like. So the bottom line of all this is walk in love with respect to other Christians in the congregation. Don't be judgmental or critical. Walk in righteousness, peace, and joy, and an understanding that the Lord is working in each one of us in different levels, in different ways. Even in different countries. There may be Christians and churches in Europe that do different things um, that over here in America would, we, would be offensive. And maybe we do things that they find offensive. And praise God, we're all a body of Christ. You just need to relax a little more and enjoy the Lord a lot more. Amen. I hope this has been somewhat enjoyable and, and that you maybe have learned something. Um, next week we will go over chapter 15 which I'm kind of excited about. I've actually already prepared 15. I'm ready to go, but it's already been over half an hour and I don't want to 
kick up the rest of your weekend. So enjoy this, um, and I'll see you again next weekend with Romans chapter 15. Go ahead and read in advance and uh, see what, what it's all about. Um, bearing one another's burdens, um, patience and comfort of those scriptures. We're going to get into that phrase a lot. There's an awesome prayer in verse 13. Um, just There's a lot of good stuff in there. So let's uh, thank the Lord for this time we've had. Lord, we thank you and we thank you for your word and that it would dwell on us richly that we might not sin against you, Lord, in any way or be offensive. And if we are, Lord, I pray that you'd open us up and open our hearts and minds to understand what it is that may be grieving you or offending, Lord. We pray, Lord, that we would be humble and submissive to you, Jesus, and let your Holy Spirit do that work in us that we so desire and change us, and that we would be corrected down here instead of having to be corrected up there at your judgment seat. Be with us and keep us until we get together again next Sunday. In your name, Jesus, amen. Have a good week. Um, you're welcome. Oh, and by the way, for the comments, my wife does tell me, and, and I ask her, please, please tell them, thank you for watching. I'm glad you enjoyed it. And uh, if it really means good, maybe you can spread it to somebody else who may be benefited and blessed by it. Uh, thank you. Bye.